All right. So, uh, EFG, EFEG, uh, fast forwarded, successful. Um, so yeah, we're here uh, in from idea to release is, is what, what we call this. So I'm not going to read through this this novel here that we have uh, at Gen Studios, but uh, this is our sort of our Bible at Gen Studios. This is this is the way that we try to present ourselves to um, to companies. <laughs> it's live stream. Uh, the way that I, I try to present ourselves to companies. Uh, so whenever we go to a company, this is sort of the template that we try to have in our minds. And this is a collaboration at Gen Studios that we've we've been making this uh, this book. Uh, it is 41 pages. And oh, I'm if you guys can see, yeah, you can't see that. Um, and so I'm just going to go through some of the high level points of it. Um, so I'm going to scroll past a lot of text and just show the images and and uh, go through the SDLC um, as as what we consider the foundation at Gen Studios and what we try to move companies toward as they're moving to uh, a much more mature, agile agile system. So um, I'm Stephen Fletcher. I work at Gen Studios and uh, I'm, I'm a software architect and been, been programming since 1992-ish or something like that. I uh, worked on the first official Legend of Zelda website and I've uh, been, been doing development ever since. A lot of different places. Uh, at the very end of this uh, or, or during this, feel free to hit me up on Slack and I will give you a PDF of this book so you can if you want you can uh you can use it for yourself you can share it with your company you can study all of the text and things like that so um let me move on down um so so yeah like i just said this this could apply to anyone um the sdlc isn't just for programmers it's for the whole business and the business um, uh, needs to have accountability just as much as a developer has to have accountability. So the first thing to talk about is um, the, the, the structure of the business, um, not just their processes, but also the people in the business. Uh, because at the very top, you have the C-level, the VP level, and, and what I call the vision team. The vision team are the people who say, we need this program to do this particular thing. So, um, uh, yeah, as also as we're saying, feel free to interrupt me at any time and and put a question because um, I, I don't want to pass by something and then and then have the context lost. Uh, so at any time, type your question. I'll I'll answer that question. But um, the 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 vision team they are responsible to to tell the company that uh, we want this thing to happen. I have this this example down here about. Uh, we want to invent social media with all the things. That's not acceptable. And you, you as the as the dev team or the scrum team, uh, should be holding the product owner and the the vision team accountable to tell them, um, you know, we need more details. Uh, we we can't just go off of this and and maybe even help train them on the types of details that you need. But it's not your responsibility to train them. It's it's sort of an accountability that you should be holding them to. Um, so you have you have the people at the top, the vision people, and you should be be expecting from them that they're going to be breaking everything down into uh, digestible pieces uh, for you. So the reason why I have uh, why I'm stopping here on this on this piece is because there's a law that I want to bring up that everyone should possibly put in their minds the way I say it. Or if you want, you can Google and, and get some more context. But it's called Conway's law. And Conway's law says that uh, a business, a business's processes and structure, if it changes, then it changes the way that the, the code is written, essentially. And um, and similarly, if the code changes, then it's going to change the way that the business's business processes work and the business structure. But it's also inverted. So you could also say the business structure and the business processes can't change unless also the code changes. And then the other way, the code could not, the code structure could not possibly change the infrastructure, the software can't change unless you make business changes as well. And that's Conway's law, that Conway's law says that those two things are tightly coupled. There's no way to uncouple them, but you can uh, you can try to make them um, as loosely coupled as possible and, and try to make some, some leeway in there as much as possible. So uh, it's important that the devs know this, it's important that we can hold the the vision team accountable and that we all know that we need to work together and come to this this as loosely coupled uh, system as possible but you can't break conway's law um so good good tidbit there conway's law maybe something you can look into 
in the future. Um, so vision and feature planning. Um, <clears throat> it's it's not just the CEO. Like the CEO is going to be like, I'm running this company, or the the head visionary, the maybe the VP of product or something like that. Um, they they can't just come up with ideas all on their own. Uh, they don't work in a box, but they work with uh, the business analysts, the the product owners. They work with the company and they decide, you know, this is the next thing that we need to do in order to provide value to our people. Um, so the developers should be able to to expect that they've got that worked out, and then they're not just running into your office in the middle of the day, being like, "Hey, we want this extra feature," you know, go to town. And then the developers are like, you know, what's going on? Um, as as often as that happens, uh, it shouldn't. And so uh, th they should really break it down. People should be able to share details about their day with all of their fam friends and family. Um, that's that's an idea. That's an idea for an epic or a feature. Um, this is this is a thing that we want to to do uh, to provide to our customers to be able to do. Assuming we're doing like a social media website or something like that. Um, and the vision team should be able to come together and decide what is a minimal minimally viable product. Like what what can we extract from this to say we could deliver this little piece. So um, it says share details about their day, which I, I requote down here. She share details about their day. That doesn't say anything about um, how to add friends or set up a relationship status or like all the things that you would expect just sort of come along with the package. So uh, as I'm as I'm speaking to uh, the vision team right now, I'm looking at you talking to you as the vision team. It should really be in your mindset of what can we deliver that it does something, but it doesn't do all the things. Uh, it's just, it's just, this is the thing we can deliver. Um, people can add details about their day. Maybe people can't even read the details about their day. Maybe people can't use the results of the feature, but they can use the part of the feature where they're at least keeping a log of their day. And then at some point we promise them in a few weeks or whatever, um, we're going to release the part where people can start reading it. And then they'll be able to read, of course, all the old ones, but MVP is, is, something that you a piece that you can deliver you don't have to deliver a whole system uh, it's not waterfall where you build an entire system and, and deliver it uh, when you're doing agile development you can really just say i've got this little bit of functionality and i'm going to put it out there uh, and that way you can get a lot of testing uh, in production I'm not, I'm, i go into testing before production also but you you get it out in front of your users you let them see it let them give feedback and it really drives the way that your business works based on what the customer's feedback is when you release these little tiny pieces over and over again. Uh, so I'm, I'm putting a lot of pressure here on the vision team to say, you guys need to break this stuff down um, and, and figure out the minimally viable product. Uh, I've got this little documentation type uh, picture here because the vision team, especially before a business starts to mature in the beginning, you don't necessarily have a, a, an IT team or an infrastructure uh, team who has set up your team wiki or anything like that. So you might just start with something like Google Docs or something secure to uh, to, to communicate uh, what you're working on. Uh, regular regulatory compliance. Um, this could be IT specific things. Uh, it could be legal specific things. Uh, some sort of government mandated regulatory compliance. Um, there's a lot to it. There's a, there's a lot to regulatory compliance, and yet this is a very short section because I'm not going into all of the regulatory stuff. But this is the part that I have in here because uh, because the higher ups really need to figure out all of their regulations and they need to hire a team who understands those regulations uh, to be able to say uh, we trust our IT team, the people wearing the IT hats in, in, in leadership to know things like HIPAA and SOX and GDPR and PCI and all these sort of things and how to set up our systems to do that. And you also need to hire completely different teams, legal teams, to figure out all your other stuff. So I just throw that in here as, as part of the system because it needs to be included in there. Uh, but for the IT team, we have technology set up. You can see over here on the on the left that uh, technology setup looks like one, the IT side looks like one little piece where the software side is fairly lengthy. But the IT side is huge. Uh, it's just not part of the, it's not a huge part of the software portion but they have all of their own stuff they need to worry about. They need to worry about the firewalls and the rule, um, the, the routing rules and the key vaults and the security and all that sort of stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so the main thing I wanna stop by here is first of all, hardware change control. 
Uh, I don't talk about hardware change control anymore after this, but I bring it up since I since I focused somewhat on change control for this talk. But uh, hardware change control is tightly regulated. You have uh, documents all over the internet about how you need to figure out who needs to sign off on spinning up a new firewall, who needs to sign off on letting people through your firewall, uh, and, and who needs to sign off on, on spinning up a new server and all this different types of stuff. Uh, and there's a lot to it, and it's very important. Um, but that's all I'm going to say about hardware change control for now. Um, oh, my change control picture. Yeah, look, they stopped it. This is the stop of change. It's pretty cool. A little bit self-explanatory. Um, but then we get down to software change control. So uh, that's what I'm mainly going to be talking about as far as blue areas are concerned. Um, so whenever I see a blue area, I'm definitely going to stop and, and touch on that. But software change control is very implicit. There's explicit pieces to it in other parts of the system, which then come together and implicitly, based on those other things, say uh, this software can be can be deployed, um, and and then eventually this, this software can be released. So I'm using the word implicit, but even though explicit pieces happen in other places, uh, so I'll elaborate that uh, more on. So let's go on down. Um, I put wiki here is actually part of this, so it's combined with this top part. Because the IT team, as they're setting up your systems, they're also setting up like your wiki. Uh, they're setting up your, your different secure systems where you can share documents. So they're going to be using their documentation in a wiki, possibly that only IT can see or, or their, own, their own department. Uh, but then once they get that set up, whether that's still in Google or if it's in Jira, uh, Atlassian, uh, Confluence, uh, or if it's in Microsoft, uh, whatever the system is, they're going to get it set up. And then um, everyone should be using that for documentation and I, I'll I might touch on that differently here in a little bit um, so software development life, life cycle uh, this is pretty much the life cycle I, I found this picture it's really really close um, and I put it on here because it's pretty much the same so over here you're going to have the vision team coming up with all of their all of their uh, everything that they want to see in their software and then over here on this side you're going to have the users who are doing um, <clears throat> user testing, um, I, I almost said user acceptance testing, but that might be somewhere in the middle. But the users are going to be testing, and you're going to have your your UX people uh, building your system so that it's getting feedback on what they're clicking on, what they're using. So that's all over here. But this is the SDLC, where this can loop. Uh, you start with planning, you design, develop, test, deploy. I'll point out that deploy is here, and then there's review, and then there's release. Uh, deploy is way before release, and I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more here in a little bit because another point of this talk is separating deployment from release. Uh, so grooming. Grooming is sort of an overloaded word, uh, and, and I say overloaded because it, it can be used depending on which agile system that you're using. It could be used in a lot of places, but I use grooming as just as, as a catch-all for all of the different all of the different things that happen before a developer starts working on the ticket um, from the time that a vision decides hey we want this thing to happen to the time that a developer picks up the user story and puts it inside of their um, in progress section and starts working on it everything between then is grooming uh, and grooming might even continue after that so i will move down to um uh, just to touch on this, forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. Um, this is the, the team cycle. If you ever Google the forming, storming, norming team cycle, it's something to look into. It's pretty cool. It's just another metric that I have on here. But this is this is the this is an old backlog style uh, where we have uh, sticky notes up on the whiteboard, and it's not too far off from what we're already doing today. Even though obviously it's more it's more digital today, but um, the main thing in here that I'm trying to, to communicate is that we have a backlog with lots of stories on it. And these, these could be stories or features um, or whatever the details are that came from the vision team and, <laughs> and, um, and then the product owners receive those from the vision team and they, they work through all of the details of what needs to happen. So I'm gonna work on the product owner now. I've come from the vision team. I'm gonna come down a level to the product owner and it's their responsibility to know, know the features that are requested from the vision team and to formalize them into user stories. 
And if you don't know what user story means, it means an actual story that's being told. So people people hear user story and they just think, oh, it's a type of ticket that's inside of my digital system. I, I either call it a task or a bug or a user story. And there you go. But a user story, <laughs> okay, uh, sorry, I keep reading the comments. Um, a user story is an actual story that you're telling. And uh, I'm gonna tell it backwards a little bit. I'm gonna start from the, First, I'll, I'll point out the points. As a, as a, this is a type of user. I want this is what you want to happen, and so that this is a business goal, and this is really important. Uh, a lot of times in in a in a less mature company, I'll see that they sort of skip the so that they even skip the as a. They just like I want to be able to add details about my day to my profile, and that's the end of the story. But <laughs> yeah, you are you're cracking me up. Um, but it's really important to get the so that in there, because if you don't have the so that, then you're going to have this portion over here be a little bit lackluster. If the product owner doesn't understand the, the business goal that's trying to be achieved, uh, and this is less for the developer, I'll, I'll admit the developer doesn't necessarily need to know the so that uh, every single time. But if the product owner can't define in a somewhat concise manner what the business goal is, and the business goal here is to deliver to the customer the 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 user experience that they're sharing details with their friends and family and how they deliver that that user experience is to be able to add details about their day to their profile but who's doing this is the user so i, I sort of explained that in a backwards fashion because that's sort of the mentality that you have to come from from the vision to get to the part that the developer is going to work on, to then uh, to then also have which users is it going to affect. This is definitely, I think, it's obvious, very important to the developer. Uh, what is the the general goal? And this this whole thing is concise. You don't want this to be paragraphs long. This this should be fairly concise. But the developer can see this and be like, okay, this is the story I'm working on. And this part right here might also be the title of the user story, um, if not maybe even slightly shorter for the title. But the developer also needs to know this because when they're doing uh, writing the code for the authorization and authentication, they need to know, mainly authorization, they need to know which users are going to be able to do this. So it's not just as a user. It might be as an internal user, as a my company's admin or as a, as a user admin. Like if you're a user and you create a little system and you're an admin of your little system and you've got like little users. So there's user admin, there's super admins um, as a consumer as a um, as a shopper, as a shopping cart user, things like that. Like who are these types of users? Whatever your authorization is working on is what that needs to be. So it's the product owner's job and developers, if you're listening, you need to put pressure on the product owners. You need to tell them, we really need this information here. We need you to not just say, vision told us create social media, you know, go to work. Product owners need to be working with the vision team and they need to really bring down those MVP, those minimally viable pieces um, that are deliverable and they need to make user stories for them. So one feature, if the vision team says we need this piece of social media might turn into multiple small deliverable pieces that we call user stories. And so you need to tell a story for each of those the developers should set the expectations that they expect this from the product owner. Um, all right, so I've beat user stories to death. Um, but like I said before, a user story, first of all, is a literal story, but then also you've got the ticket type. You've got a task, you've got a user story, um, and you've got a bug, and you've got other little things that you might have because you might be able to create custom types. Um, uh, what was that? There's a Kim? question um, about rolling, add, delete, and edit into one user story. Like, what are your thoughts on, um, like, when do you combine those into one versus keeping them separate? That's like the perfect kind of questions that I was looking for. That's really cool um, because that is it, it's it's tough to communicate that at first because that's a very technical implementation type thing. Um, so. Long story short, it should be in one user story. It, it, right there, one user story. Um, because the 
you need to be able to tell it like a story from to a user. And so you you wouldn't really say um, like for this, I'm talking about adding a user story or, or adding details to my day. And when I say add, I'm not talking about a database operation. I'm talking about um, I, I'm, I'm sort of I'm confusing the topic a little bit, but I'm talking about from the context of a, of a human being able to add something about their day. Um, of course, when we say delete, we're talking about deleting something from a database, whereas delete from a user might just be hide it from other users. I can still see it. Maybe I'll show it later on. There's there's a whole lot to that, and you should be able to tell that story. So I, I guess in one sense, it sh you shouldn't discriminate database functions from the user story because there might be a lot of database functions happening within one user story. But on the other hand, if if you're talking about from the user's perspective, uh, deleting or up, or updating, updating is perfect, updating their details, you don't necessarily have to talk about that in the context of a database update. If I say as a user, I should be able to update my my uh, what I did yesterday, the contents of my day yesterday, then you don't want to put that in the sense of a database update. The reason why I'm trying to make that super as clear as possible is because if I update my post, I could very well just do, be doing an insert in the database, a historical insert, because I want to keep a history tracking of things. So the word update to a user story isn't the same, or delete or add in a user story isn't the same as a database operation. Um, update and delete might do some sort of change tracking. Everything in a database might just end up being an insert. It, you might never delete anything, hard delete anything. You might never update anything. You might just do another insert with a date uh, timestamp and you always just get the latest or whatever the case is. Um, reads and inserts might be all you ever do. So so from a developer's perspective, you I would say add updates and deletes should all be in one user story. As far as the, from the database developer perspective go, you don't try to separate those out into different technical pieces, but from a user's perspective, add up, update, and delete are different user stories. You don't want to conflate the two, though. Um, so, I, yeah, it's good to differentiate. Uh, I hope that I hope that helps out. And feel free to um, continue asking more on that if you want me to expand some more. I'd actually say if you want me to expand even more on a specific topic, join the call afterwards would be perfect. Um, and otherwise, uh, if you think that it's something short right now, feel free to jump in right now. It's fine also. Um, so I, I beat user stories to death, I think in, in a way, but there's the user story ticket inside of your system. So there's the, inside the user story ticket, you've got the actual story that you're telling about what needs to be done. But then also in the user story ticket, you have a section for, uh, acceptance criteria and the acceptance criteria. Uh, I probably need to edit this. This was, this was written pretty hastily, but the acceptance criteria essentially says, Given that something exists, like given that a feature already exists, so this is not the thing being worked on in this story, this is because some other feature exists. So given that some other feature exists and, and it might require two or three other features, when I, when I try to take some new action um, that doesn't exist, I, I try to um, add details about my day or update my relationship status, when I, uh, click on update relationship status. This is something that doesn't exist um, or it might exist, but maybe it's gonna have a different outcome. Then some sort of new outcome is going to happen. So this is my acceptance criteria. Uh, and acceptance criteria is supposed to be short, succinct. Um, it's not supposed to get long. So this one says like, I fill out at least the required fields. It doesn't list every single field here. So you've got a user story, it's fairly succinct each, for each story. So for this user story, I've got an acceptance criteria that says fill out the required fields. Given that I can do that, whenever I hit submit, then this happens. Somewhere else inside of that user story task ticket can have all kinds of details. It'll link to a design document, it'll link to an, impl link, link to an implementation documentation, um, and there'll be all kinds of details, maybe pages. Uh, it'll have regulatory links for the legal team. It'll have all kinds of stuff. Uh, but the acceptance criteria should be fairly succinct. And this is another thing that I'm putting on the plate of the, of the PO, the, the product owner and the business analyst to start, 
but we're starting to pull in QA here because QA is going to be able to help write these acceptance criteria because they're sort of the, the subject matter experts. They're them and the BAs are the people who know the system really well and they can be like, okay, well, we've got this and we've got this. So we need to have it when this new thing happens, then this happens and they can start to get these acceptance criteria in here. This is what the developer works off of when they're doing their initial development. They work off of this. They make sure that all of their functionality works with the given when then acceptance criteria. But then they'll move into um, test cases. When, when they think they're done, they'll run through actual test cases, which I'll go into uh, here in a second. Um, so we've got one of these blue sections here, implicit change control. We've created a user story. And this isn't a programmer who created a user story. Um, and I, I, I also want to sort of specify that this user story is on the backlog now. Um, uh, <laughs> You're bringing up Sprint, which is which is good. Uh, I sort of touch on that in a little bit. If you're doing a Sprint, I would say we're still we're still pre-Sprint. Um, if if that's the if you're working on Scrum and this is the way that you're working on, um, I don't specify Scrum in this document. Uh, it's 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 just sort of an agile mindset, and I actually don't preach Scrum. I try not to, even though I'm I am a past Scrum master. But um, but yeah, this is this is pre pre-Sprint. But by the time this gets onto the backlog, even if you're even if your company is the type of company that that lets um, pretty much anyone in the company create user stories and and throw them somewhere in like a backlog backlog, it's somewhere specific. Once this gets pulled and groomed by the product owner and the BA and the QA in the backlog, that is implicit implicit sign off that that this is something that's approved by business because the product owner isn't just some Joe Schmo on the street. There's someone who's trusted in the business with the responsibility of saying, this is a user story that works. So I'm really harping on implicit change control here to say that, whereas in some other document, you'd have like a checkbox that says this feature was approved by the business and then like have someone sign their name or something like that. That's what's happening here because you have a, a digital system that's, if you're using if you're using note, uh, sticky pads, it's not the same thing, but if you're using a digital system, you have a, uh, a person created this user story who's the product owner, they've groomed it and they've moved it into the product backlog, not just a random backlog anyone can add to, but they have the responsibility of saying, I've signed off on this as a feature we really want because I've put it here. So implicit change control. Um, and this is the part where I was going to get to uh, the test cases. Test cases and acceptance criteria are closely linked. They're tightly coupled. Uh, for each acceptance criteria, there should be at least one test case, probably more, but there should be at least one test case. And so uh, in the case of an acceptance criteria that says, given that I'm, I can log in when I click change my relationship status and, and when I click a new relationship status from a dropdown or something, then my relationship chat status should update. Whereas the test case for that would be one Go to the website that the web, website shows. Two, log in. You're logged into your your system. Three, go to your your system settings. You can see your system settings. Four, and and it goes through the step by step. That's a test case, um, and it might even be have a proceed a test case saying one uh, or this this depends on a, a user account having been created. So those test cases might say. You need to create a test account. You need to have it named this. You need to have it start with this type of thing. Test cases get really in depth, whereas um, uh, the acceptance criteria, the given when then portion of the user story are fairly concise. It's just talking about this is the thing I want to see happen. The test cases are talking about like which test user you're, you're using, actual dollar amounts if you're working with money and actual dollar results, uh, things like that. Um, and these... The reason I'm talking about this, even though I know there's a lot of developers in here, is because these are obviously expectations that you should have on QA. In this case, test cases are from QA. QA should have at least started making test cases and the acceptance criteria should be outright done before a developer comes and starts working on, uh, working on a user story. So uh, developers should have that expectation and we should be putting that expectation on um, the the dev team, not the dev team, the product team and the vision, the vision team. So yeah, who's responsible? Uh, QA is responsible for test cases. 
QA and business analysts would work together and communicate mainly with the product owner to write the given when then. The user story, actual story part should mainly be the product owner, but working a little bit with the BA and the product owner working with the vision team. So that you start getting these layers where um, you have one level separation from you on each side that you're working with um, as, as you go down. Um, so that's that change control and that's the test cases. And let's skip through a lot. So a lot of this, I'm not gonna go through because there's a lot of like a developer needs to do an implementation plan and, and all sort of stuff. And like I said, if you stick around or if you ping me in Slack and ask for this document, I will give you the PDF uh, of this document. Yeah. Um, so here, I know you asked about sprint uh, sprints we don't push sprints. We don't push time boxes because it's going to take as long as it takes. And time boxes always break. Uh, there, there's no way, there's, there's no one who's going to tell me that they've always had a perfect time box every single time, unless they then say, and then we have a lot of downtime a lot of the time. Sometimes we push to the end. Sometimes we have a lot of downtime. Um, it, it, it just doesn't work out. Um, so so uh, what we say is, we will we'll work on it as hard as we can. We'll do it right, and we'll get that stuff out. And TDD is very important, and TDD is part of what I talk about right here on before development. So as you would imagine, before development, it's test-driven development. So you start with tests, it's before development. So um, uh, stories should be in a constant flux of grooming. So, so your sprint planning is usually like, oh, we're going to sit down for six hours or whatever. We're going to groom through all these things and get as much as we've done. And then everyone adjourn. Whereas uh, the, the best way in reality is just to say, once the product owner and the BA and QA have really worked out uh, the, at least down to the acceptance criteria, not test cases yet necessarily, but they've really worked it out, then we'll get a developer involved to tell us what technical uh, issues there might be. And so that's just sort of as, as it comes along and a developer will sort of stop their work. Maybe every once in a while, look at some user stories and be like, okay, this looks like we can pull it in later on. And then if there are some sort of serious questions, we can say, we're going to have a, a three amigos meeting. Um, and that's something you can Google. It's not necessarily a required meeting type. Uh, we're going to bring together the, the different layers of the, of the business and say, let's really discuss this because it's not fully clear yet. Uh, and, and that should sort of be a very agile um, flow as, as you go through. Um, mm -hmm, yeah, that's fine. Um, this is, this is really just talking about communications. I, I like, I like non meetings. Oh, this, this works for every size company. Um, I guess if it's a really small company, you can start to sort of ignore some of these pieces, but not not completely ignore them just because by virtue of the fact that one person's gonna wear 10 hats or whatever the case is, they don't have to have like a meeting where they talk about the different hats talk because if they're like me, they talk to themselves all the time, something like that. Um, but but uh, uh, large enterprise, from, from the largest size enterprise down to a medium level startup business this is definitely all required because in a medium sized startup business or even a smallish startup business, you're going to have more people wearing less hats. Uh, maybe each person will wear two or three hats. And in that case, you still want to follow all this sort of thing. Me, myself and I, yes. Um, so this meeting type I'm talking about, it's a non-meeting, but developers get together. They do code reviews. Um, they, they do uh, lunch and learns. Um, and sort of like the three amigos things, people will come together and they'll talk about uh, the user stories while they're grooming and that sort of stuff. Um, so I, that's why I have this special little graphic right here. TDD, uh, Nikki Jones. So uh, test-driven development is very important to me. Um, and, and the idea is not just unit testing, but implementation planning also. So you've got your user story. We're getting to the devs now. So we've gone from the from the vision team to the product owners to the BAs to the QA and the devs getting involved now. Okay, we've got this. <sighs> um, so the dev needs to put together an implementation plan. 
they need to say we we understand you're given when then but we're going to write some logic we're going to we're going to ask uh, we're going to figure out if we're going to need database changes because a lot of times you'd be like this won't require it so stop it but if you're like okay we're obviously going to need to add a column of some sort here or we're obviously going to need to spin up a different microservice or another server somewhere then you need to start pulling people in um, once you start getting that down um, I, i'm going to come back to to the unit testing portion because I think somewhere in here, now nah, I'll, okay. So I'm just gonna say for now, the prerequisite is thinking about the different levels of testing. So I'm gonna skip through a lot of this and not go through a lot of it, except for feature gating. And again, we're not doing these things right now, but we're thinking about these things. So uh, I'm gonna say, I, I, didn't, I didn't do it. I know it was somewhere up here, but somewhere up in the user story, we've decided this is a feature and we're going to say, um, we have a feature gate tag. It's a tag called uh, allow relationship change, relationship status change or something like that. Um, and so as the developer says, okay, this feature is for relationship status changing, they can say, I'm going to create that feature gate inside of whatever our settings service is or our key value pair storage Redis or console or whatever. Um, we're going to create the feature gates. We're maybe going to put the feature gate name into a constant in code or something like that. And, and uh, we're going to, we're, we're going to be able to deploy our, our feature gate creation because we're not actually doing any implementation or code. We're just, we're just, we're just coming up with these ideas and I'm going to scroll down here. Of course, like I said, let me know if you want a copy of this, you can read through it. You should be able to create interfaces create models and create those feature gates and even possibly create some some mock testing but not not fully but create a lot of these parts that aren't implementation and even compile them push them to master uh, and and get them deployed out to production without anything more than regression testing because you're not making any changes to the system you're not uh, and, and this is there's a lot in this document about this but you're not making any changes that are going to break the system. The system will continue to run exactly as it had um, before now. So yeah, uh, Apache, join, join Slack. Um, it's, it's a perfect place to talk to me about anything you want to talk. So uh, we have begin testing, unit testing up. Um, this is the TDD part. So we've, we've got everything down to actually, let's start programming now. Um, we've even possibly created the interfaces and the models and, and some other things um, as a precursor to the actual implementation. So we want to now implement those interfaces or, um, or, or whatever the changes are that we're going to be doing. Um, so you do start with unit testing. We do have that in here. And definitely creating test cases before you start writing code. Um, and, and that was the QA's job. Unit testing is uh, in, for for some of the people in here who aren't the developers. Uh, unit or if you are a developer and you don't focus on unit testing necessarily like you should, the unit testing is a bit of code that you write that tests a bit of other code. So the bit of other code is the implementation that says um, add two numbers, is, and you have an integer and an integer. So you pass in two numbers, it adds them and returns it. That's the code for the implementation. I write a test that just tests that code. If that code hits a database or something, it's no longer unit test. That's that's implementation testing, it's system testing, you're going out to everywhere else. Unit testing is, I'm gonna write a test that says, I expect two numbers should be able to be added in my system without affecting anything else. And then you write the code that adds it and you test the code and that's test driven development. Um, where does security fit in? Do you see the most value letting them be there at the start and then double check implementation and test in parallel with QA. Good question. I know that I'm coming down to the wire on time, but I'm going to talk about uh, the security portion as part of the change control here in, in just a second. So the test driven development, very important. Um, DBA tasks. In our implementation plan, we've decided we need a database change. We need someone to uh, add a table or add a column or whatever the case is to the database, or even a lot of the times we've created a new uh, select statement, a, a new query, and that query might be janky as heck. It might not be using the right indexes or whatever the case is, but something to do with the database. 
we have a task for database work or um, uh, data layer work or whatever the case is, a DBA needs to sign off on that. And this is another part of implicit change control such that the, the person wearing the DBA hat is, is going to say, okay, I've looked at this script, it changes the schema or whatever the case is, and they move their task to done. And, and that's the DBA who's, who's the trusted person who would usually sign this off on a, in a checkbox and sign their name on a, on a change control form. They've signed their name. They've, they've closed this ticket, this ticket uh, that says that they've reviewed this, the scripts inside of this user story and, and that's done. It's a task under the user story, yes. Um, and, and so, yeah, we, we've signed this off. Um, and then that task will be part of the pull request, which I'll talk about later on. All the tasks associated with the pull request for the changes that are being done. Um, and that gets to the security question that uh, Goomba C was, was asking. So implicit change control, a DBA has signed off on this. <clears throat> um, there's also a lot of front end stuff here. And a lot of the front end stuff follows the same exact patterns as the back end stuff. The thing that I'll point out here for the front end stuff is the user experience work. There's there's a lot of a lot of stuff in the design earlier on, even in the vision. You're talking about the, the design people are there, the user experience people are there. They're different things, um, and they're talking about uh, how they want to track all of the things that the user is doing whenever they're using the system, whether this is an external user or an internal user, whatever the case is, they wanna be able to track that stuff. Um, all that stuff is inside this document also. Um, uh, I'm gonna skip over this part because, because as, as this part says, <clears throat> we support working out of trunk, but not every business is ready to work out of the master branch um, because it's also not literally working out of the master branch, it's really close to that. Not every company is ready for that. Um, and if your company is not ready for that, if you're still working in multiple different uh, pipeline releases and everything like that, and this part would be for you. But I'm going to skip down to this part, which is pretty much a duplicate. If you can see on the side here, they're pretty close to the same thing. But this one's talking about specifically for like the master branch. So um, for the master branch, uh, whenever, whenever you do a PR to the master branch, a dev does a PR, it goes to the master branch. The PR approver now says, um, I approve this. And this is the security part that Goomba, Goomba C was talking about. The PR approver is reviewing the code to make sure that there's there's nothing malicious in there. And the PR approver, it's a it's a port, it's an approver, someone who's trusted to approve the code to move on into the master branch. So this shouldn't just be just a bunch of random junior developers or people new to the company. This should be a trusted person. And this person is saying, as far as security is concerned, of the software, I'm not talking about hardware. I talked about hardware earlier, if you weren't here. Hardware has lots of security things and lots of practices for their change control that they need to sign off physically. But for, for software, you've got the, the DBA scripts and the PR approver is going to be looking at the DB up and down scripts and making sure that there's tasks for that, making sure that the DBA has closed the task for that. And the PR approver is going to be looking for any security holes in the code. And that's their main job. The PR approver isn't making sure that the code was written according to the user story. Uh, they, sh they, they don't need to have any knowledge about even how the business works at all or what the user stories are. They're just making sure there's nothing hugely wrong and no security flaws inside of the, inside of the code before they let it go on. It's QA's job to test it to make sure it works according to the functionality. Um, but the PR approver approving a PR is a sign off saying this code has no security holes and, and the DBA tasks are associated with it and the DBA has, DBA has signed off. Obviously the user story is already signed off on by product because they created it or they moved it into the system um, and all that sort of stuff. So another, another change control thing there. Um, deployment to production. All right, we're, we're doing this in production. So uh, I, I'm running short on time, so I don't, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip over some of this stuff, but feel free to join the call afterward and I have plenty of other things to say about this. Um, this is pretty much just saying what I said that all of the implicit change controls happen. And then I'm gonna skip down to this part. So a, a deployment, if you followed along, um, or if you read the document, you'll see when you get to this part, a user can't change the relationship status at the point. You've deployed the code to production, but they, they 
go to the place where they can edit their settings and there's no option there to change the relationship status. And that's because the code is there, but the person who, who uh, controls the feature gating, the developer made the feature gate saying can change their relationship status or whatever the case is, the feature gate has not yet been turned on. The coolest thing about this is that the system, as, as far as the logic is concerned, hasn't changed. So you can deploy to production without anyone even testing the code, that the new code. Um, what you do is you deploy to production and you do regression testing, make sure that the system still works as, as, as usual. And a lot of regression testing can be automated. So you're not wasting anyone's time. You can deploy features to production instantly. I mean, a developer, a PR gets approved, you might as well just, de just deploy it to production. Um, of course, you want to do regression testing in your different environments, and there's a whole lot of other stuff to that. But there should be no fear there because you have a feature gate. The release is when it's been in production for an hour, a day, or whatever, and you release possibly, possibly a phased release. You release to a couple users. You just turn the feature gate on for everyone. You don't have to restart the service. You can turn the feature gate on. Like you've done your regression testing, the code's there. It works as 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 usual. Turn the feature gate on, seems fine. Oh, there's a bug, just turn the feature gate off. No need to like restart the server, redeploy, do all kinds of things. Um, you, you just turn the feature gate back off and like, okay, well, we need to figure this out. You don't have to go pick up a hot fix and really quick do something and move it in. Uh, it's th this whole system, this agile system, especially centered around decoupling deployment from a release and um, implicit change control. And, uh, and and just everything in this document really helps you move toward uh, fast deployments, easy releases, um, and, and a very agile, simple lifestyle. I'm right at 1225, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say that um, any final questions, and maybe we can move this into something else. There's also uh, in this document a glossary: what is CI/CD, what is NuGet, what is a schema, DB up down, all these different things that that I talk about in here. So there we go. Whew. Got through it. 41 pages. <laughs>